Hello everyone, I'm Theo Hartzell. In today's video, I want to explain to you Daniel's prophecy in Daniel chapter 9, verse 24 through 27. This prophecy is amazing and full of detail, and I'm going to explain some things about it that maybe you haven't thought of and is going to really solidify and clarify some things for you in your mind. Dealing with the church, dealing with the nation of Israel, dealing with the Messiah, who the true godly Messiah is, and then who the Antichrist is and where he's coming from, at least from a general sense. I'm also going to try to help answer the questions around the rapture by using this prophecy to show you whether there is a pre-trib, mid-trib, or post-trib rapture, because this prophecy will help bring all that together. It will also help show us about the church age and about the 70th week and where and how is that fulfilled. This video is going to be full of information and a lot of detail. I think you'll be blessed. If you need to, you can pause the video, digest everything I have on the screen, and then unpause it and go back to listening to me talk. With all of that being said, I just want to jump straight into the video and I'm going to start out looking at one verse real quickly in Matthew chapter 24, verse 15. And Jesus Christ himself is talking, and he says, When you therefore shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet stand in the holy place, whoso readeth, let him understand. And we're going to look at this later, but let me say right here, Jesus himself is tying in to one of the hallmark things that I want you to look for in regards to the end of the world is the abomination of desolation that Daniel spoke of. And that is covered in this 70-week prophecy of Daniel that we're looking at. So now going to Daniel chapter 9, starting at verse 24, and I'm going to read it through and then we'll come back. But seventy weeks are determined upon thy people and upon thy holy city. Now, what are the seventy weeks determined to do? Here it is. To finish the transgression and to make an end of sins and to make reconciliation for iniquity and to bring in everlasting righteousness and to seal up the vision and prophecy and to anoint the most holy. Those are the things that will happen because of the 70-week prophecy. Now, going back up to the first part, let's go through that slowly. It says 70 weeks. That first word, 70, is the Hebrew word H7657 Shabim, which means 70. In other words, the literal number 70. So it's 70. That word for weeks right there is the Hebrew word H7620, Shabua, which means seven, a heptad, seven years, a group of seven, either days or years. So in other words, this Shabua can be a seven-year period or a seven-day period, and you have to let the context determine which way it's used. And that's what's called a heptad, or a group of seven, depending on whether days or years. Now, let me jump in here and explain something to you about prophetic interpretation. And I've covered this in other videos. But prophetically speaking, there are often times a principle of one day is equal to one year. And that is the case in this prophecy. And we are able to validate it because we can look back on it and see how it fits in. But there is this prophetic principle throughout the Bible of one day equals one year, prophetically. What do I mean and what are some examples? Some examples that I can give you is that the children of Israel sent 12 spies into the promised land they came back with a negative report, turned the hearts of the people away from God, and God made all of them wander in the wilderness for 40 years. Why? 40 years 
because of 40 days. God himself is the one who said that. Then there's a case, an example, where God told Ezekiel, you're going to lay on your left side for 390 days for the 390 years of sin and iniquity of Israel. And Ezekiel had to lay on his side for 390 days, a day for a year. And God also told Ezekiel to lay on his right side for 40 days for the 40 years of iniquity of Judah, a day for a year. And this principle could go on, and I could even tie it into Jesus in the wilderness 40 days, undoing the 40 years in the wilderness of Israel, and we could go on through other examples. I've brought this out before. But the thing I'm trying to show you right here is prophetically speaking, there is often a principle of one day equals one year. Why is that important for this prophecy? Because when you take the 70 weeks, you will realize that it's 70 times 7 or 490. And so you have then a 490 year period, a day for a year. So this whole prophecy is going to cover a 490 year prophecy. That's what I'm trying to show you. And some people will even try to tie this into the Sabbath years that Israel did not keep. And I can understand and see that, but it's just so much easier to understand the one day equals one year prophetic principle, and it's 490 years, and you'll see this as I go on. Because let's go to the next part that I wanna focus on, and it says, 70 weeks are determined upon thy people. Well, who is thy people that this prophecy is talking specifically about, and the prophecy is specifically for? Because this is important. It says, 70 weeks are determined upon thy people. This is the angel talking to Daniel himself. And Daniel was a Jew. Daniel chapter 5, verse 13 says, and this is Belshazzar talking to Daniel, Art thou Daniel, which art of the children of the captivity of Judah, whom the king, my father, brought out of Jewry? This verse is showing us that Daniel is a Jew. And when the angel said that this prophecy is for thy people, that means that this prophecy is for the Jewish people. This is going to be important. Pay attention to that. And what does the next part of the prophecy say? It says, and upon thy holy city. Now we just identified that Daniel was a Jew taken from the captivity of Judah, meaning the area of Jerusalem. But we're about to see in verse 25 that it specifically, this prophecy specifically calls out Jerusalem. Now, why is this important? Because I want you to understand and have this in your mind as we're going through this, that the prophecy given to Daniel was for Daniel's people and the holy city of Daniel, which is none other than Jerusalem, which means that the prophecy is for the Jewish people, not the Russians, not the Chinese, not the Africans, not the Americans, not the Australians, nobody else. The 70-week prophecy is dealing specifically with the holy people of Daniel. Now, I'll say this throughout this video, but I'm not saying that all the other people of the world are not affected, but the prophecy is for the Jewish people. The prophecy, the angel told Daniel, is for thy holy city, which is Jerusalem which means the prophecy has Jerusalem as the focal and center point of the whole prophecy. In other words, this 70-week prophecy is not for Dallas, Texas. It's not for Philadelphia, New York City. It's not for anybody in Egypt, Africa, Asia, Canada, South America. It is specifically for Jerusalem, one city, Jerusalem. And like I'm saying, I'm not saying that the rest of the world will not be affected, but the prophecy is for the Jewish people. 
And I'm gonna keep driving that home because that's going to be very important for us later because the 70 weeks is for the Jewish people alone and for the city of Jerusalem alone. And therefore, anything taking place and transpiring inside of that is for the Jewish people and the city of Jerusalem. And anybody outside of that affected is because they're trying to do something to the Jewish people or they're trying to do something to Jerusalem itself. And so they might be in prophecy, but it's because of what they're doing for this prophecy is for the Jewish people and Jerusalem. Now let's go on to verse 25, and I will read it from start to finish. Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and build Jerusalem unto the Messiah the Prince shall be seven weeks and threescore and two weeks, the street shall be built again and the wall even in troublous times. Now, let's go back up to the beginning and go through this slowly. What was the starting point of the 70-week prophecy? It says right there, from the going forth of the commandment. But specifically, which commandment is he talking about that ushers in and starts the 70-week prophecy? Because that's very important also. And it says, from the going forth of the commandment to restore and build Jerusalem. That's important because there was actually four different decrees that were issued for the benefit of Jerusalem and Judah. And the only one that specifically gave command to restore and build Jerusalem is recorded in Nehemiah chapter 2, verses 1 through 5. And it is a historical and biblical fact recorded in history that Artaxerxes gave a command and authorization to Nehemiah to go back with legal authorization to start rebuilding Jerusalem, and that happened in around 445 B.C., before Jesus Christ was even born. And that is what actually starts the 70-week prophecy. So you start from right there, and you will be measuring from this point 490 years. And that will give you the 70-week prophecy. Now, let's look at the next portion, which says, Unto the Messiah the Prince shall be seven weeks and three score and two weeks. And this is important and critical because this is talking about the Messiah himself and who he is. And some people try to say, well, this just means an anointed person or someone who is anointed to come. However, that is not the case. This is actually talking about the one and only Messiah. The Hebrew word here is H4899, Mashiach, which literally means the Messiah. It does not mean just an anointed person or just some prince. It is literally talking about the one and only Messiah that God prophesied in Genesis 3.15 would come and bruise the head of the serpent. It is the one and only true Messiah. The Septuagint, which is a Greek translation of the Hebrew scripture, in the Greek, translate this word here as Christos, which is the Greek word for the Messiah, the anointed one. And we know because of the benefit of looking back, that this was literally none other than Jesus Christ himself. Christ is Christos, the anointed one, literally the Messiah, Jesus Christ, Yeshua HaMashiach, the Messiah. And I just wanted to focus on that because this identifies that Jesus Christ himself is none other than the Messiah that this prophecy is looking forward to and gave us the starting point to say, hey, this time frame is going to come and that is going to be your Messiah. And Jesus fulfilled this scripture exactly. And you can study this out in history, but Jesus actually fulfilled this and completed this exactly like this prophecy says. Now, going back to the prophecy, how long is this period going to be to and for the Messiah? And it says, unto 
the Messiah, the Prince, shall be seven weeks and three score and two weeks. Now, three score and two weeks just means 62, okay? So you've got seven weeks and 62 weeks. When you take seven plus 62, that gives you 69 weeks. So we had a starting point, and that was from the going forth of the commandment to restore and build Jerusalem unto Messiah the Prince shall be seven weeks and 62 weeks, which would be a total of 69 weeks. And we'll see in a minute that that is actually when the Messiah got cut off. And so from the starting of the prophecy to the time the Messiah gets cut off will be 69 weeks. Everybody say 69 weeks. Okay, to go on with this prophecy, what will happen in the meantime while waiting for the Messiah? It says that the street shall be built again and the wall even in troublous times. And wow, did that ever come true? Because if you read everything that Nehemiah went through, Sanballat and Tobiah trying to kill Nehemiah, they did everything they could to shut the whole project down. And in fact, they sent letters back to the king and actually got it shut down off and on several times. They threatened them. They threatened to kill them. It was very troublesome times. But now let's go to verse 26 and read through it. And then we'll go back through it slowly. And after 62 weeks shall Messiah be cut off, but not for himself. And the people of the prince that shall come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. And the end thereof shall be with a flood and unto the end of the war, desolations are determined. And so let's go back to the first part where it says, and after three score and two weeks shall Messiah be cut off. And you might be saying, well, why does it say three score and two or 62 weeks? Because the first seven week period was expired for the city of Jerusalem and the walls being rebuilt. And that was allocated for that. And then it had another 62-week period, and then Messiah would be cut off. So you've literally got your seven weeks and 62 weeks, which adds up to 69 weeks. So what this is literally saying, at the end of the total 69-week period, the Messiah, the Mashiach, the Christos, the true Messiah of God himself, will be cut off but not for himself. And why would he not be cut off for himself? Because we understand that Jesus Christ was crucified for the sins of the world and so that all whosoever would could be saved. So at the end of the 69th week, because this is specific for the Jewish people and specific for the city of Jerusalem, at the 69th week, Messiah who actually came for the Jewish people, was crucified and cut off for many people. This will make more sense in a minute. But now I want to break down into something that you're going to have to pay very close attention because I'm going to go into the next part of the prophecy. And this can be a little confusing for people. And I'm going to try to make it as simple as I can. But listen to me very carefully and Pay attention here. The next part of the prophecy says, And the people of the prince that shall come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. Now, the reason that I say this is a little confusing and you have to pay attention is because this prophecy is actually dealing with two different people or two different groups of people or two different situations that are going to arise. And what I mean by that is it says, and the people of the prince that shall come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. So the first group that we're going to focus on is the people of the prince and what they shall do. And then the second group or person involved is actually the prince that shall arise from the group that shall do the things that they're going to do. 
So let me restate it again. There's two different groups or two different sets of people. Number one, the people of the prince, and then there is the prince that shall arise from the people. So there's two different things going on. We're going to go through this slowly. Now let me reread it again. And it says, and the people of the prince that shall come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. And that can be a little confusing. So let me write it again, but I'm going to remove the phrase of the prince that shall come so you can see what I'm talking about. And if you remove that phrase, it says, and the people shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. So what are the people in this prophecy going to do? It told us right there that the people that he's talking about in this prophecy are going to come and destroy the city and the sanctuary. What city is it talking about? We have already seen over and over that this was for Daniel's holy city and verse 25 called out Jerusalem specifically. So when it's talking about destroying the city, it is talking about destroying the city of Jerusalem. And when it says, and the sanctuary, then we know it's talking about the temple that is in Jerusalem. Okay, let me jump in here and ask you a question. After Jesus was crucified, what nation or group of people came and destroyed the city of Jerusalem? And I'll give you a big hint. In 70 AD, what nation or group of people came and destroyed the city of Jerusalem? It was Rome, the Roman Empire. Let me ask you this question. Which nation or group of people is the ones that came and destroyed the temple and ripped it completely apart and tore it down that not one stone was left upon a stone just like Jesus prophesied would come? What nation or group of people did that? What was it? It was the Romans. It was the Roman Empire. Let me ask you this. What nation or group of people is the ones that crucified the Messiah, that scourged him, whipped him, beat him, pulled his beard out, gambled on his clothes, and took a spear and thrust it into his side so that blood and water flowed out? What nation or group of people did that? And the answer is the Romans, the Roman Empire is the one that did it. What does this mean in relation to this prophecy, the Antichrist and the tribulation and all these things that we'll look at in a minute? What does this mean? This prophecy is literally telling you that when it says a prince shall arise from the people who shall destroy Jerusalem and destroy the temple, And let me say this right here. There's not even a temple right now in Jerusalem to destroy if somebody wanted to come destroy it. So it's talking about the Romans who Jesus himself prophesied would come destroy Jerusalem and the temple. And this therefore means that the prince that shall arise from the people who destroy Jerusalem and the temple means that the Antichrist that's going to rise up, the beast, is going to be an individual that is either a Roman by descent, by bloodline, a natural-born Roman, or he will be someone from a revived Roman empire. The Antichrist, this false Christ, the beast that we're talking about in the book of Revelation, is none other than a Roman connected to the Roman Empire according to this 70-week prophecy of Daniel, which was for the Jewish people and the city of Jerusalem specifically. And you might be wondering and saying, well, wait a second, what about the 70th week? Where did the 70th week go? And I'm about to show you that in a minute, but I want to first finish up with this prophecy So let's just go ahead and go into verse 27, and then I'm going to go address these other things, and then I'll come back, and then we'll look at some things that Jesus said. So let's finish up this prophecy in verse 27, which says, And he, and that's talking about this prince that will arise from the people who destroy Jerusalem and the temple, which I believe to be a 
Roman prince from the Roman revived empire or whatever, and he, this risen prince, shall confirm the covenant with many for one week, and in the midst of the week he shall cause the sacrifice and the oblation to cease, in other words, the sacrifices and offerings, and for the overspreading of abominations, he shall make it desolate even until the consummation, and that determined shall be poured upon the desolate. Now, what is this Roman prince going to do? You just saw right there, he's going to confirm a covenant. Now, how long is that covenant going to be? He just gave you an answer that when this prince arises, he will confirm or ratify a covenant with many, and that's going to be important, for a period of one week. Now, we've already covered this over and over, one day for a year. So how many years would this one week period be? And the answer is yes, seven years. Now, let me jump in here and put some things in context to help us understand where we're at. Daniel's 70-week prophecy said that after the 69th week, or at the close and ending of the 69th week, that Messiah would be cut off for the behalf of many people. And we know that that was Jesus Christ, and Jesus Christ was crucified. Now, if the weeks were consecutive, there should have immediately been a 70th week, or a one last seven-year period, but it has never manifested and has never happened. Where did the 70th week go? Because if the 70th week was consecutive, then there should have been a worldwide, or at least in the known world at that time, there should have been a worldwide or known world confirmation of a covenant of peace treaty, and then exactly three and a half years later from the crucifixion and resurrection of Jesus Christ, there would have had to have been a prince from the Roman Empire rise up and do an abomination of desolation right in the middle exactly three and a half years later, which we know biblically and historically never happened. The 70th week has not happened. And you might say, well, what happened then? Where did the 70th week go? And I'm telling you that this is something I'm going to dig into right now. But what happened was what the Old Testament prophets could not see because they were blinded from it by God himself. And that is in the crucifixion and the resurrection of Jesus Christ and the outpouring of the Holy Ghost and the beginning of the New Covenant, none of the Old Testament prophets were allowed to see the New Testament church and the fact that the Gentile believers were going to be grafted into the church, and there was going to be a church age that split the 69th week and the 70th week, and everybody that was going to come into the church would take place inside of that. There's literally been two th almost 2,000 years of world history transpire from Jesus' crucifixion to the point we are now, and yet the 70th week of Daniel's prophecy for the Jews and Jerusalem has not been fulfilled. Why? Because we are in the church age. And I want to look at some of the words from the Apostle Paul in Ephesians chapter 3, to show you exactly what I'm talking about. Verse 1, For this cause I, Paul, the prisoner of Jesus Christ, for you Gentiles, if ye have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God which is given to me to you word. In other words, the Apostle Paul in the New Testament is telling us there is a dispensation of the Gentiles, a Gentile dispensation where the Gentiles are being grafted in, the wild olive tree grafted into the natural olive tree, and the Old Testament prophets did not see that this was going to happen. But there is a Gentile dispensation in the church age where Gentile believers are allowed to come into the church and be saved. Going down to verse 5, which in other ages 
was not made known unto the sons of men as it is now revealed unto his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit, that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs and of the same body and partakers of his promise in Christ by the gospel. And this goes back to part of my point because the Apostle Paul is telling you right here that the Old Testament prophets, including Daniel himself, including the Daniel 70-week prophecy, did not see a Gentile church dispensation where the Gentiles were going to be given a time and a space to come into the church and to be saved. And the Old Testament prophets didn't see it. Daniel didn't see it. And therefore, this 70-week prophecy did not even see it because the 70-week prophecy is for the Jews and Jerusalem and is not for the church, is not for the bride of Christ, and is not for the church age Gentile dispensation. Going down to verse 8, Unto me who am less than the least of all saints is this grace given, that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ, and to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery. Did you see that? The mystery, which from the beginning of the world hath been hid in God, who created all things by Christ Jesus. Colossians 1 and 26 also echoes the same thing. Even the mystery which hath been hid from ages and from generations, but now is made manifest to his saints. I know I'm going over this over and over, but I'm trying to let you know that prophetically speaking, these prophets were forbidden to see the New Testament church age and the fact that the Gentile dispensation was going to be in the church. In fact, the Bible says that the rulers of the world didn't even know what was going to happen. And if they had known what was going to happen, they never would have crucified Jesus in the first place. And the Bible also says in the book of Luke that Satan entered Judas and betrayed Jesus unto death because Satan wanted to kill Jesus so bad. In other words, the Old Testament prophets didn't see what was going to happen. The rulers of the world didn't see what was going to happen, and Satan himself didn't see what was going to happen, or he never would have crucified Jesus in the first place, because when Jesus got crucified, Satan lost the keys of his very own kingdom. Now, let me jump over briefly and talk to you about the church age very quickly and briefly and bring in some of the writings of the apostle Paul and this will help explain to us what happened between the 69th and the 70th week and how this ties into the rapture, pre-trib, mid-trib, post-trib, how this ties into the tribulation and then the covenant that's going to be broken. And I'll explain all that here as we go. But first, let's look at the writings of the Apostle Paul. And he said in Galatians chapter 3, verse 27, For as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. And y'all have heard me talk about this scripture many, many times, that in the New Testament church, in the Bible, you better be in Christ to be part of the bride of Christ. And that happens in water baptism. The apostle Paul himself is the one who linked it. He said, as many of you has been baptized into Christ, have put on Christ. Verse 28, there is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither bond nor free. There is neither male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. In other words, he is saying in the church, we are all one in Christ Jesus. And let's continue on in Romans chapter 11 looking at what the Apostle Paul has to say about Gentiles in the church age and how it relates to the nation of Israel. Romans chapter 11, verse 7, What then Israel hath not obtained that which he seeketh for? And we understand that's talking about Israel as a nation. It says, But the election hath obtained it, and the rest were blinded. 
Now notice that phrase right there, the election hath obtained it. That explains why there are Jews who believe in Jesus, although Israel as a nation does not believe in Jesus. There is an election that hath obtained unto it, and see that Jesus Christ is the Messiah, and they are Messianic Jews. Okay, let's ask another question. Why did Israel as a nation not accept Jesus as their Messiah? Paul gives us the answer in verse 8. According as it is written, God hath given them the spirit of slumber, eyes that they should not see, and ears that they should not hear unto this day. Why did that happen? Verse 11 gives us the answer. I say then, have they stumbled that they should fall? God forbid. But rather, through their fall, salvation is come unto the Gentiles for to provoke them to jealousy. In other words, the Jewish people did not just fall to fall, they fell and did not receive Jesus as their Messiah so that salvation could come unto the Gentile people. And I don't know if you've ever thought about this, but if the nation of Israel would have realized Jesus was their Messiah and accepted him as a nation as their Messiah, there never would have been a church age. The 70th week of Daniel would have immediately been implemented, but the people of Israel as a nation did not accept him, and therefore the church was born, and Gentiles are being grafted in into the New Testament church. Now let's go down to verse 25. For I would not, brethren, that ye should be ignorant of this mystery, lest you should be wise in your own conceits, that blindness in part is happened to Israel. And again, we're talking about Israel as a nation. I don't want you to be ignorant of this mystery. And I don't want you to be conceited about the fact that you're being grafted in. Why? Because blindness in part is happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles become in. And this is incredible, important, powerful, critical. You must see this. But the Apostle Paul is telling us right here, that the nation of Israel is blind to the fact that Jesus is their Messiah until the fullness of the Gentiles become in, which means there is an end date for the blindness of Israel and a day when the scales will be removed from their eyes and they will realize that Jesus Christ is none other than Mashiach, the Christos, the Messiah that they had been looking for and did not realize it. And the Apostle Paul says, look, I don't want you Gentiles to be conceited or ignorant that there is a fullness of the Gentiles. In other words, there will be a day and a time where no more Gentiles will be allowed to be in the bride of Christ according to the Apostle Paul right here. That word for fullness is the Greek word 4138 play Roma, which means completion, what is filled in a container to make full or fill up. In other words, there is a certain amount of space and a certain amount of numbers that are going to fit. And when that is filled up, then that is going to close the fullness of the Gentiles and the church age of the Gentiles is over. There will be a day when God is filled up and full with a container of the Gentiles that he wanted to save that would be saved. And when that happens, the eyes of the nation of Israel will be opened, not just the elect, but the whole nation, and they're going to turn back to Jesus Christ. Now, let me jump in here to make sure I cover how this deals with the rapture, whether there is a pre-trib, mid-trib, or post-tribulation rapture. When does the rapture happen? The whole reason that I went into this is to show you that at the end of the 69th week, Jesus was cut off and the 70th week never has happened. And there's been almost 2,000 years of world history happened since then and in the meantime. What does that mean? That means that there is a 70th week for the Jewish people, Jerusalem, and Daniel's Jewish people that has not happened. What's going on in the meantime? 
What's going on in the meantime is the church, the bride of Christ, composed of Jews and Gentiles, male and female, bond and free. Anybody whosoever will come is the bride of Christ and is being in Christ Jesus saved in between the 69th week and the 70th week. So how does this tie into the rapture? It ties in in this way. When you go to the book of Revelation, you will see that the first three chapters of Revelation deals with the church. And then from Revelation chapter 4 to like Revelation 19 or so, the church is never mentioned again. The Greek word ekklesia, the called out ones, which is talking about the bride of Christ. They're not mentioned again from Revelation chapter 4 all the way almost to the end of the book of Revelation. Why? Where'd they go? I'm telling you where they went was in the rapture. Well, how does that tie into the pre-trib, mid-trib, or post-trib? The church age has been going on between the 69th and 70th week. There is one seven-year period that has not manifested yet because it's for the Jewish people alone and Jerusalem alone. And in the meantime, Gentile believers have been coming into the church which the Apostle Paul him said would be a fullness of the Gentiles come in, and then it's over, which shows me according to Daniel's prophecy and the Apostle Paul's own words that the church is raptured out of here before the seven-year period starts. And I will actually tell you this, that I personally believe that the pre-trib rapture of the church is what actually ushers in worldwide peace when millions of believers disappear all over the face of the earth, every nation, tongue, and kindred. That is what is actually going to usher in worldwide peace and allows a Roman prince or a prince to arise who will step into power as the Antichrist, make a peace treaty with the world, and then in the middle of it, three and a half years later, He will break it and go into the newly rebuilt temple and the restarted sacrifices and stop it and make himself up and set himself up as God. Now, why is that important and how does that tie into the prophecy of Daniel? Because the prophecy of Daniel said that there would be a prince rise up from the people that would destroy Jerusalem and the temple And in the book of Revelation 13, you can read about this individual, but he is the beast, the Antichrist. He goes by many names, and it says that he will confirm the covenant with many for one week. Now, the reason that's important, that word for many, when you look at the book of Revelation, is dealing with the regard to many people. For example, in Revelation 17, when it talks about the great horse sitting on many waters, it's talking about many people. And this Antichrist figure is going to make a covenant with many people for one week. And why is that important? Because we've already seen that it is a seven-year period. Well, how long is the Great Tribulation? The Great Tribulation is seven years long. And listen to what will happen. It says, In the midst of the week, he shall cause the sacrifice and the oblation to cease. That word for midst right there is the Hebrew word H2677, which means literally in the middle of something, right smack dab in the middle. So Daniel's prophecy is saying right in the middle of the seven-year period, which would be at the three-and-a-half-year point, in other words, 42-month, 1260-day, or time, times, and half a time, at exactly the midpoint of the seven-year period, this risen prince that's from the people who will destroy Jerusalem and the temple will cause the sacrifices and offerings to stop, which means that they will have been reinitiated or there will be a temple or something going on when this happens. And I'm not going to take the time to go in the book of Revelation, but if you go there, you can read about this beast, Antichrist, the false prophet, the great whore, and all the things that are going on there. 
But what I want to do now is I want to jump over into Matthew 24 to look at some of the things that Jesus said about Daniel's prophecy and the end of the world. And we'll start with what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 24, verse 3. And as he sat upon the Mount of Olives, the disciples came unto him, unto Jesus, privately saying, Tell us. Here's three questions that they asked Jesus. Number one, when shall these things be? Number two, what shall be the sign of thy coming? And number three, what will be the signs of the end of the world? So that is the three questions that Jesus is answering as he goes on and continues. In verse 5, in answering their question, he tells them, look, he said there's going to be false Christ come up and they're going to deceive many people. They're going to be saying that they're the Savior of the world. He says in verse 6 that you shall hear wars and rumors of wars. Don't be troubled. All those things are going to pass, but that is not the end. Verse 7, nation will rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom. There will be famines and pestilences, earthquakes and divers places, and all of these are the beginning of sorrows. And jumping down to verse 14, look at what Jesus said. And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations, and then shall the end come. Notice that. Jesus said that the end would come after there had been an adequate witness of the gospel preached in all the nations of the world. That is when the end is going to come. Now, let me say this right here. When he says that the end is come, that does not mean that the world is going to end in the next five minutes or 10 minutes or 20 minutes, but it's going to usher in the actual end. In other words, the ending is going to start, and that is going to be the seven-year great tribulation from the book of Revelation, and I'll show you that in a minute. But first, verse 15, when you therefore shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet stand in the holy place, whoso readeth, let him understand. In other words, Jesus just told you in verse 14 that the end would come when the gospel had made an adequate witness into all the nations in the world. And then immediately tells you to look for the sign of the abomination of desolation that Daniel prophesied about and told you about, which means that we are back in the prophecy from Daniel, which means that we are dealing specifically with the Jewish people and Jerusalem again, which means that we have transitioned back from the church back to the Jewish people and the city of Jerusalem. And notice what he said in verse 21. For there shall be great tribulation such as was not since the beginning of the world to this time, no, nor ever shall be. And except those days should be shortened, there should no flesh be saved. But for the elect's sake, those days shall be shortened. Now let me bring this to a close and try to give you a takeaway summary. The 70-week prophecy of Daniel in Daniel chapter 9 was specifically for the Jewish people in the city of Jerusalem, which by default means that it is not for the New Testament church and was not for the Gentiles being saved and was not for the Gentile dispensation because Daniel was forbidden to see it by God and Daniel was only looking at what was related specifically to the Jewish people and the city of Jerusalem. At the end of the 69th week, the Messiah was cut off and the 70th week has never yet been manifested. Why? because that was the initiation and starting of the church age where the apostle Paul said the nation of Israel did not recognize Jesus Christ as their Messiah, and the election of the Jews hath obtained unto it, and Gentiles have been grafted in. And that is the church age. And the apostle Paul also said that when the fullness of the Gentiles is come in, in other words, a certain number and a certain amount is done, then that is going to finish the church age 
and that will be the rapture of the church. And the church is going to be raptured out of here, which means that there is a pre-trib rapture, which then ushers in the last and final 70th week of Daniel, which is a seven-year consecutive period. And when the pre-tribulation rapture happens, that means that there will be a prince that shall arise from the people that shall destroy Jerusalem and the temple. And we saw that that was the Roman Empire. So this Antichrist who shall arise will be from the revived Roman Empire or will be a Roman by descent himself. And what he will do is he will confirm a covenant for seven years, a seven-year period. And in the midst of that, in the Hebrew, Hatsi, right in the middle of it at the three-and-a-half-year point, he will break it, which will mean that there will be a rebuilt temple. In other words, he didn't destroy it now because it's got to be rebuilt. And the sacrifices will have been restarted, which means they started somewhere. And it will have a rebuilt temple, and they will be offering the sacrifices again. And in the three-and-a-half-year period, or 42 months, or 1,260 days, or time, times, and a half a time, he steps in, he breaks the peace treaty with the whole world, and stands in there and makes himself God and professes himself to be God and then you have all of the vials and trumpets and seals and mark of the beast and the whole nine yards in the last seven-year period. Why is that important? Because in the book of Revelation, in Revelations chapter 1, 2, and 3, you see God dealing with the church, the ecclesia, they're called in the Greek. However, from Revelation chapter 4 to about Revelation chapter 19, you do not see the ecclesia, the church, mentioned whatsoever because God is dealing with the nation of Israel again as a people because the scales were removed from their eyes and they realized that Jesus was their Messiah and all of this is going on. Amen. God bless you. I hope this has answered a lot of your questions and shown you how all of this ties together and how important and critical it is to interpret scriptures biblically, line upon line, here a little, there a little, precept upon precept, and rightly dividing the word of truth. I love and appreciate you. I want to say thank you to everybody for praying for me, covering me in prayer, thinking of me and my family, your nice, kind comments about the videos. I want you to know I'm praying for you, and I'm asking you to pray for me. God bless you. I love you, and I can't wait to see you in the next one. Until next time, I love you. Bye-bye.